Okay, so um, hey everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, we're very, very excited to have you here. Uh, my name is Oletha from GitLab APEC Sales Development Team. Uh, today's webinar will be talking about Agile Planning and DevOps Insights, which will be presented by our Senior Technical Account Manager, Jonathan Lim, and our DevOps Engineering and Solutions Architect, Rob Williams. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this webinar is being recorded uh, and the presentation and the slides will be emailed to you after the webinar has finished. Okay, so if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel below. Uh, I will compile them during the presentation and we give some time for John and Rob to answer your questions at the end. Um, we also have a couple of polling questions throughout the session. It will pop up on your screen and all you need to do is pick an answer that's most applicable to you. Um, all right, so now let me introduce our presenters today, starting from Jonathan Lim. So Jonathan is a senior technical account manager here at GitLab. He's based in Singapore. Uh, prior to joining GitLab, he worked in the big data analytics and application monitoring space. Having seen the cost to rectify production issues, Jonathan wants to help organizations adopt DevOps best practices to fix their problems earlier and quicker. Um, we also have Rob Williams joining us today from Sydney. Uh, Rob is an experienced DevOps engineering consultant who in the past has worked with large enterprise organizations to build and deploy web applications as well as roll out digital workflow, workflow transformation before joining us here at GitLab, where he's been helping to bring modern DevOps practices to more companies. So without further ado, let's begin. Over to you, Rob. Thanks, Aletha. So we're going to start uh, straight up off the bat with uh, one of those polling questions that Aletha mentioned. So the first, the first polling question that we have is, what flavor of agile methodology are you currently using? So there's a couple of different options here. We've got Kanban up there, we've got Scrum, we've got test-driven development, and there's a couple of uh, miscellaneous options for, for other people. I'm just gonna give it uh, about a, a minute here, between 30 seconds and a minute to see what sort of uh, version of Agile you guys are using. As the results come in, it's, it's seeming like the, the majority is Scrum, so we're at about 40% Scrum and 24% uh, Kanban and then uh, reasonably even split among the, the rest. And with about 80% of people, 90% of people reporting now. Again, this is, it's, it's continuing on like, and, and the vast majority is Scrum and Kanban. And that's not surprising. That's why we, what we see a lot in the, in the market. And it's where the, the GitLab agile planning focuses on as well. So now that we've got that, let's end that poll and move on to the next one. So the next poll we've got here is asking what tool you currently use for your project management. So this is, is looking specifically at the tooling. So we've got Jira and Confluence, and, and already they're off to a flying start as expected, but then the other ones, we've got Asana, and then if you're already using GitLab Agile Planning, or if you're using another tool, your Trellos or something like that, let us know. So we're getting people responding a bit quicker now, so we're gonna close this poll off in a few seconds, but we're getting about 40% uh, Jira Confluence, 40% others, and then about 18% GitLab with one, one user being in Asana. So it's interesting information. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting that 18% that of people here are already using GitLab. Hopefully we can show you something about how to use GitLab that, that you didn't already know. And for the rest of you, we can introduce you a bit more to, to what GitLab can do in this space. So before we get into the, the actual capabilities, uh, I wanna talk about a couple of uh, strategic uh, imperatives that's, that, it, that uh, lead towards GitLab being a, a really good agile planning tool for your DevOps uh, workflows. And the first is this concept of concurrent DevOps. And this is really about breaking down the silos in between your teams so that they can all work together in uh, rather than a, a long sequential line where you're handing off work from one team to the other and you have these 
silos of DevOps practices, right? So your one team might have some DevOps practices and they might be very good, but then because they have to hand off to another team with their own DevOps practices that are different, uh, that, that can slow things down. And what we really need is a concurrent DevOps uh, platform and DevOps lifecycle to deliver uh, uh, an end-to-end -end capability. And one, one of the biggest uh, roadblocks to uh, concurrent DevOps is the tool chain tax. And, and this is where you have all of your different tools, like uh, your, your Jira's and, and your Jenkins and, and all these things, and they're, they're all integrated together, but you still have to hand off between these tools. And, and oftentimes when you're in different teams, Different teams use different tools. <clears throat> Pardon me. Different teams are using different tools. And so it, it leads to a more complicated interface, a, a, more, co a more complex visual language and, and context switching for developers, product managers, and everyone involved in the software development lifecycle as a whole. And what GitLab really offers is that, that, that single platform that, that allows all of the different personas to participate in the software development lifecycle. And that's really important when you're looking at the analytics that go, go into every stage of the, the DevOps lifecycle, because even if you optimize at one end, say your, your create your, your source code repository, you still need to be able to uh, have insights into your configure end, uh, into your application platform, as well as your project management. All of it comes together into a single platform to deliver the end-to-end the -end DevOps lifecycle experience. So what I'm gonna focus on is how GitLab works in this first branch, this product management way, looking at the, the manage and plan stages and, and how GitLab enables the agile planning capabilities uh, in the DevOps lifecycle. So the first part of that is going to be how we organize our teams, right? So uh, there's a, a, hier a very hierarchical nature here with um, groups, and subgroups. So this is where you would store your, like where, how you would organize your team members into their business units, their functional teams. However you split up your team members or, or your projects, this is how like you, you can accomplish this with that, the, the group subgroup hierarchy. And then uh, within any of the groups or even at the base level, you can have projects. And this is where you store your source code, you'll have your pipelines, as well as uh, planning specific work for the, that specific code. So now that we've organized our, our teams and, and the people doing the work, what we really need to look at is how we can define the work that those people are going to be doing. And there's two different levels of that. Well, two, two, two and a half, because epics can have sub epics. So epics are a, a, a higher level. Uh, they tend to be uh, capabilities or long running pieces of work, things that, that are going to take you a, a little bit longer and have a bit more meat in, the, in, in what you need to do. Contrasting with that, you have your issues then, uh, and these tend to be very small and discrete pieces of work. They're your user stories and your functional acceptance criteria. So now that we've defined uh, how, you, how you do the, how you, we've defined the teams and we've defined the work, now we need some way to plan out uh, how the work is going to, to function. And for epics, we have what's known as a roadmap. And, and the roadmap is basically a Gantt chart where you can see all of the epics and the sub epics uh, on and their, their start and end dates displayed as a Gantt chart so that you can uh, see when lots of capabilities are going to be lining up when you might have lots of releases coming out or Whenever, whenever there's going to be a, a bit of a bottleneck for when your features are going to be released. When it comes to the issue level, we have uh, what's known as milestones. So the most common usage for milestones is around sprints. So because these are for your small discrete pieces of work, you can use milestones to categorize issues uh, in, in that way. So, so that you can go from one sprint to the next sprint to the next sprint and you can see what was released in any given milestone. So we've organized our team, we've defined the work, we've planned out the work, and then when you're doing all of that work, it really goes into the, the project level. And this is where you see the code, the code reviews, the discussion about individual problems and, and pieces of work. Uh, it, it all exists at that project level. 
So if we bring all of that together, we see GitLab's agile planning structure and, and the capabilities that can be uh, driven through that. So uh, this is, this is the, the, the it provide, what it does is it provides the ability to coordinate your teams onto the same page uh, and provide that traceability that you need throughout the entire workflow. And so here, what we've got is just a, a simple breakdown of how, how that could look in, in an example project. So, so you'll have your upper, upper group, your company, and then you'll have individual store, you could have individual storefronts and they'll have their own uh, epics that they're doing because they have their own needs and their own requirements. Uh, and then underneath that, at the project level, we have uh, an, a project called billing, and then that has its own issues, which is where you're actually doing the work that relates to those epics. So when we look at uh, issues and epics, one of the, the biggest differentiators that, that, that GitLab issues and epics have are, are labels. There's a couple of different types of labels, and, and what, what they do is they basically define the, the most important metadata about your issue. So you have your epic and your milestone defined, and these let you define what, what feature it's going towards or the, the time period that you're gonna release it. But then there can be a lot, lot more things that can be found and decided about individual issues. So you can label them with any sort of uh, description. They're, they're, they're entirely customizable, both at the, the group and the project level. And uh, the, the labels form the backbone of, uh, and, and the most important part of GitLab boards. So here we've got some examples of how boards get uh, generated based in around how GitLab uses them in the quality team. So with the, the GitLab boards, there are three different ways that you can create lists of issues to visualize how the work is going. The first is the milestones. So this is really useful for scheduling issues and categorizing them into different uh, sprints so that you can see one sprint, two sprint, three sprint, and you can see which sprints have too many issues, whether you're using a points-based system or just the straight number of issues. You can see where you're gonna have that bottleneck of a lot of work waiting to be done for a specific uh, milestone. The next dimension you can use is the assignees. So you can directly create lists of issues for individual users so that you can see which team members have a lot of work on for the, the current sprint. So in that way you can sort of, you have your scheduling of the work and then your scheduling of the people. And then once you've gotten past uh, the, the, the planning stage of the work and you're actually starting to do the work, you can use labels like we discussed earlier to create individual lists of issues that are based that, that contain that label. And when you drag issues from uh, labeled lists, the, the labels get taken off and added as you enter and exit the, the columns. And that way it lets you do your, your workflow boards, your, so you can go uh, ready, for, uh, ready for dev, developing, ready for test, ready for deployment. However you have your workflow, you can create your labels in your own way. And, and beyond the individual workflow, it, what, what it really does is it uh, provides that flexibility to allow teams to do whatever they like with the labels. So what you can see with the, the GitLab quality team here is that uh, they've used labels to create different priorities, P1, 2, 3, 4, and that, in that way they can see when they've got a lot of really, really high priority issues that they need to be working on. And with that, I think that uh, I'm handing over to Jonathan now quickly. Thanks, Rob. Can you guys hear me all right? Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so let me, all right, I moved it into presenter view. Can you see my screen, uh, Rob? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think Rob kind of talked a little bit through like the planning stages of uh, where GitLab's at in the platform. And we're gonna, it's more like a segue or like moving into the other component here. Um, so just to begin, how are you currently measuring and collecting data on your people, processes and tools? 
Um, and I know there's like GDPR and all that kind of stuff, uh, but we're not talking about like collecting privacy data, but more like, um, you know, uh, are your tools being monitored by like APM or like uh, log monitoring solutions? Are your people monitored by certain metrics or KPIs? Um, or even so, uh, like your processes, like uh, your end-to-end -end, uh, time from like time to value and so on and so forth. Right, so I, I see that a lot of people are currently not monitoring a lot of these things at this point, uh, which is actually you know, interesting. And I hope this second part of the presentation will be really um, useful for you and kind of give you an idea on like what we at GitLab kind of believe in terms of like monitoring some of these things at your organization, which can help you to make better decisions. Okay. All right. So I think we got about 90% of the votes. Um, so I'll end the poll here. Um, so let me just share the results. Um, so yeah, we have about 75% of uh, the people saying that they don't really measure a lot of these things. And I, and I, and I think uh, hopefully I can convince you today that it's quite important, right, to, to, mo the, to measure some of these things. Right, so that brings me to my topic, which is insights, right? So GitLab Insights, the idea behind it is um, um, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And what do we mean by that, right? So Gartner has come up with a new market category that's called the DevOps Value Stream Delivery Platform. And that's where GitLab is currently uh, developing ourselves or trying to mature in this space at, at this point in moment. And in short, I think what we are trying to do here is really to provide visibility, traceability, and observability into your workflow, right? So not having it like a black box where you're like, oh, where is my money being spent? So let me uh, give you a scenario over here. So imagine that you are a, um, like a team lead or you're like a director of DevOps at your organization and you are given a budget by your finance department or so on and so forth of $100,000, right? So out of this $100,000, where do you spend that $100,000? So you know that in your previous year, you had issues. Um, yeah, some of your development processes were a little bit slow. Your projects were kind of running over time, over budget, so on and so forth. But you're not exactly clear about where do I need to invest in for my next budgetary year, such that we can actually gain the most impact, right? Get the most impact out of it. So do I invest in more compute because you know I'm not running my CICD tests or my pipelines uh, 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 frequently enough? Do I need to provide more infrastructure? So maybe my GitLab platform, or even if you're running GitHub or on-prem or, or, or even some of the other things, are they a little bit slow? So do, do I need a HA kind of a solution? Do I need kind of a geo kind of solution, which allows me to you know, access it from multiple regions? Uh, do I just need to hire more developers, right? So maybe your developers are being hammered right now. Um, there's a lot of uh, your, uh, your developers are just working day and night and they're really just not being able to cope. Um, should I be having longer sprints in this case, if you're using agile development? Um, and because of having longer sprints, does that also mean I need to hire more, develop, uh, more project managers? Or is security a concern, right? So when you're decision making, I guess that's the part where you need to be concerned about. But how do you make these decisions? So I think that's where GitLab, um, where, where at GitLab we believe that some of these decisions, uh, some of these tools um, can help you to make your decisions a bit better. So uh, right now we do have approximately 20 different reports that are available um, and dashboards that are available. But of course today, uh, I'm not going to bore you and go through with you all 20 different ones of them. Uh, but I'll just focus on a couple, or not a couple, but actually just eight uh, dashboards over here. Uh, to give you a flavor and idea, uh, if you do need uh, clarifications or you do want to actually talk a little bit about it, just reach out, let us know. Uh, we will definitely um, start. Uh, we can have a separate conversation uh, in detail on, on some of these. So first and foremost, um, starting from a high level, um, some of these executive insights. Uh, so I'll go directly into the first one, value stream analytics. So what does value stream analytics really means? It's um, time to value. So from the moment of ideation, when you come up with an idea um, and then you're like, hey, you know, I got a project that I want to do to the point where you decide that that is uh, uh, 
that that it comes a prototype is a, a prototype comes out or it's something that you can push into production that's your value stream right so how long does that take from you to come from an idea all the way to a product at the end goal um, in between of course there are the different steps as you can see here there are issues plan code test review staging and and so on and so forth these are the ones that GitLab we believe are like the default stages in terms of a software development lifecycle. But at the same time, we realize that maybe different organizations operate differently. Uh, so as, as early as 13.x um, that we have, uh, we did realize that it might be actually really good if you could define your own stage. So we added this new functionality over here called add a stage. So you can actually define a new stage. You can put your start yeah, your step event and then your end events to actually define these stages accordingly. So what does this do? Helps you find out where your bottlenecks are. So you know that, hey, you know, um, we are spending a lot of time in uh, uh, plan, uh, in maybe, um, you know, our staging environments, right? So you, got, you can actually focus your attention or focus your resources on a specific stage. Uh, and, 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 you know, out of that hundred thousand dollars, in 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 that sense, you can then uh, put a bigger chunk of that towards that that project. Okay. Next thing is CI/CD analytics. Um, as the uh, as the name suggests, it basically gives you a overall um, pipeline run duration in terms of like your your week, months, and year. Uh, it tells you your success rate. I think that's basically what you really want to measure in terms of your CI/CD pipelines. Uh, whether they are failing, whether they are successful. Um, and then it, that's not just it, right? So given this form of information, what can you deduce from it? So first things first is that if you see a lot of failures, what could it be? Um, I mean, of course, you need to do a bit more like um, deep dive into it, but it could be the case that uh, your, your, your runners are being um, overloaded, right? So your runners are being overloaded, then there are a lot of failures. You're not having enough infrastructure that, that, that's required. Um, or it could mean training, right? Your developers are not being trained well enough in the sense where they are not able to um, write proper CI-CD um, scripts, right? So in that sense, that's something that maybe you want to invest in having more training for your developers to actually write better, um, you know, your pipelines and all. all. Right. So this gives you an idea about how you can actually spend your money, again, um, to invest in your team. Third thing, I think Rob earlier mentioned about uh, when we're talking about epics. And one of this dashboard that I think really summarizes or helps you to visualize all of these epics in a, in a proper way, it's uh, the, the roadmaps dashboard. Um, so the roadmaps dashboard uh, helps you to organize it and helps you to visualize it across time uh, on where, whether certain epics, certain like uh, features, uh, when, when would they uh, get pushed into the, the product, uh, product itself. So say, for example, now that we are at GitLab, uh, the version that we're running uh, right now is, I think, 13.5 or so. Um, so with that, uh, you can actually see, and I'll show you later as well in our demo, um, what are the features that are being slated for your next version, so your 13.6, 13.7. And that gives you that credibility and you know, that, that transparency to your customers or even to your management to like, hey, you know, these are the things that we are going to be spending our time on for the next year, for the next month or so on and so forth. And because of that, we need this certain level of investment um, for our teams. So helps you to also uh, uh, understand, are we building the right things at the right time? So are these features in the next release really important or can we actually push those features into an, a further release later on uh, because of like the lack of uh, resources and manpower? Right. So these are like things that help you to make these decisions. And last but not least, um, we do have another, the, the, the DevOps score. So the DevOps score, it helps you in general uh, to uh, uh, measure your organization's maturity in DevOps adoption. So uh, this is more like more from a GitLab um, um, definition of DevOps score. Um, and what we do is that we, we, we break it down into the different uh, parts of it, which is like issues, comments, milestones, bots, so on and so forth, as you can see in the screenshot. So what we measure is that how much, how uh, are you utilizing all of these features um, and whether these features are able to, uh, whether these features can help you. Um, so we understand that in the industry level, 
there is the DORA metrics as well. And that's something that's on our, our roadmap. So DORA metrics is something that's more industry-wide in the sense where um, they do measure on certain um, uh, values such as deployment frequency, lead time for changes, time for to restore uh, services and change, uh, and change failure rates. So some of these things are actually something that we are actually moving into our next iteration on. We don't have a timeline on that yet, but we are assuming this is something that's going to happen next year. And then we'll input all of these uh, like sort of industry-wide best practices into how we measure um, your DevOps adoption at your organization. Okay, so look out for that. That should be coming around next year or so. So that covers basically the um, executive insights. And I just want to touch quickly on like the four different insights for productivity, developer, operations, and security. So first and foremost, productivity insights. Uh, what you can see is that you have dashboards over here. So these dashboards are able to give you, um, help, help you to see like the number of bugs that have been created over time, your merge requests, regression, uh, and, and, track, and, and how, how these are tracking over time. Helps you to see whether in a specific uh, month or so is there a lot of issues and then you can drill down into like, oh, hey, you know, maybe there was a new, new feature that was actually uh, released during that time. And this feature actually created a lot of issues. Uh, so maybe we do need to put a bit more attention on that. Developer insights, contributors. So you can actually see in terms of like your overall commits uh, to master and uh, uh, to, uh, by each of these users. Uh, so this is not a, a, a tool to actually track whether your developers are slacking, but rather it's kind of a tool to understand whether your, your developers are actually being overworked. So if you actually see a particular developer that's you know, committing too much, you don't want to burn your developers out. And therefore it gives you an ability to like, hey, you know, this guy, maybe it's, he, he's really doing a lot. Let's promote this guy. Or even so it's like, hey, this guy is doing a lot and he's the only one on the project. Maybe we should hire a few more developers to actually help him out. Operations Insight gives you a basically a very high level overview in terms of your environment, whether your tests are passing, your pipeline status and your last deployments. So it gives you an overall idea if like, you know, overall in terms of your, your, your infrastructure, whether they're healthy or not. Um, of course, this is a point in time um, and then you can always do a little bit more customizations with creating Prometheus dashboards and, 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 um, and so on and so forth. But this is kind of our first iteration of like our operations dashboard. Uh, and last but not least, security insights, right? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, security is actually a very big part of it. And we do have like, uh, we have done another webinar uh, by one of our colleagues by Summer as well, in terms of like the adoption towards uh, like a DevSecOps uh, methodology at your organization. But having these sort of dashboards give your, your management or give your team anyway, an idea on like, hey, how are we doing in terms of like managing our security risks, our vulnerabilities, our code dependencies and so on and so forth, right? So this dashboard really gives you um, that high level overview and knowing, well, should we be focusing a lot more on security or do my team needs a lot more training in terms of like uh, delivering more secure code in that sense. Right, so I covered eight dashboards and I think what I'm going to actually uh, drive across the idea is that um, these are all just um, metrics that you're collecting, but collecting metrics don't mean anything if you're not going to feed it back. So the reason why we kind of came up with this topic is that we hope that this is actually a loop or a cycle back in terms of like once you get all of this information, this information should help you to actually plan your sprints better to help you to develop products better in a better way, right? So moving back into what Rob has mentioned earlier as well, hopefully this information that you have collected over here will then help you to, you know, create those milestones better, create those um, epics better in a, in a more granular way and um, make your decisions better in that sense, right? So that's a high level overview uh, and we'll move on to the demo. So Rob, I think we'll start to, start this off and he'll go through with you like sort of the workflow of how we actually use uh, stage planning. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Jono. Um, so I should be sharing my screen now and you should be able to see uh, some GitLab user interface. Um, yep. I've gone ahead and, and created a company, Company Incorporated, uh, and set up some, some groups within there. So we've got our, our marketing team, we've got our infrastructure team, we've got our BI, business intelligence team, the app dev team, and then a general CI templates uh, project. 
And then underneath that, we've got individual projects and, and subgroups within those teams that allow us to, to get more specific about what those uh, groups and projects are actually doing. So if we take a look at the infrastructure group here, we can see that we've got a multi-cloud tenancy here. We've got Google Cloud, where they've got an application platform and some network configurations, as well as some, some things in, the, in AWS. And uh, because, because this is focused mainly around the, the planning, what we've, we can do is if we come in and have a look at the epics, we can see that we've got one epic that's currently underway, and that's our scaling the cloud application platform. So if we come into that, we can uh, have a bit, see a bit more detail. So there's there's not much description here, but you can you can put anything we, we liked in there. We can see all of these four issues that have already been created. So uh, within the infrastructure for AWS, infrastructure AWS, uh, as well as for network configurations or application platform. Uh, so you can see all of the the work that needs to be done under this epic within the epic itself as well as any discussion that's been going on uh, about that epic. But uh, if we jump into any one of the, uh, let's, let's jump into the AWS project and take a look at that a bit more closely. So here we're at a specific issue, but if we come back out to the Amazon Web Services and we, we look at the issue list, we can see our two issues here. And if we come over to the boards, I've gone ahead and, oh, it must have been in the other project, my bad. So if we come back out to the infrastructure, we go to Google Cloud, uh, then we should be able to see a board, hopefully. Nope. Sorry, I'll find, I'll, I'm sure I'll find the uh, project that has my, my already created boards here eventually. No, if not, then that's fine. We can create them as we go. It doesn't take very long and the, the boards are very flexible. So if we come over to this board, we can see that it's created a development workflow board with to do and doing already. But before we start actually doing these issues, we need to plan them out. So if we go ahead and create a new board and we'll call it sprint planning. So you can see I've created a few boards in my time already. And I don't think we need the closed list for that. So we're just gonna create that board straight away. And by default, it's added those two lists, but we can go ahead and remove them. And now we've got a blank board. And if we add our list for that for our milestones, we can add in some of our pre-created milestones. And I think that before we update any network configurations, we probably need to update the, the Terraform script. So let's go ahead and put that in Sprint 1 and we'll put the, the network configurations into Sprint 2. What we can do then is we can create another board. Again, I don't think we need the closed one for this and we're gonna call it uh, team assignments. This is where we're going to assign some of these issues to individuals, right? Again, we don't need these board, these uh, lists. So we're just gonna go ahead and remove them. And we're gonna add uh, lists for each of the assignees. And you can see that me and John are members of this of company Inc. Where we're here and we're, we're ready to work and upgrade our cloud platform. So we're gonna add columns in for each of us, and then we're going to assign them to individual people. So you can see that already that that's assigned that issue to me and the other one to Jonathan here. So now if we come back to our development board, now we've got a little bit more information on these individual issues. So now what we can do is we can edit this development board and we can limit its scope to a specific milestone. So if we say sprint, if we say started milestones and we, we save that, then because that sprint one starts today, then it's only showing issues from sprint one. And Jonathan, you're lucky this sprint, you don't have any work, but I'm gonna go ahead and drag this one to doing. And so that's, that's just how a, a general sprint planning could go within GitLab, right? So. We, we even did it from, uh, from scratch, from a blank project uh, with no boards. We made our sprint planning board, our team assignment board, and now we've started development. So with that, I, that's uh, the, the plan demo. I think I'll hand it back over to Jono and he's gonna take you through some of how GitLab uses our insights features. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just give me a moment. All right, so. Can you see my screen all right? Okay. 
so I'll just go through a couple um, again uh, due to the lack of time. So first things first is I think our DevOps report. So this is an example of our DevOps report over here. Let me zoom in a little bit more because it might be a bit too small. Um, so over here, what you can see is uh, uh, you can see like how we actually define some of these things and uh, what we actually, how, how do we actually get um, these informations is that, or, or how do you get this lead information is basically um, when you turn on the ping test as in the ping, uh, so it actually uh, sends some of this information back to our GitLab servers and it basically compares them against all of our GitLab uh, uh, customers as well. So in terms of adoption of a certain uh, a certain feature or so. So not only that, do we just give you numbers and we don't give you any suggestions, right? So over here, if you were, were to have like questions on like, oh, how do I, what do milestones actually mean? You can actually click into here. It would then give you like an idea on like what these milestones, how you can do it. How do you actually uh, create the ones? So similar to what like Rob was doing just now in terms of a demo, this gives you the documentation on how do you actually adopt milestones at your project. Um, not only that, we do also include certain types of articles. So for example, it's like why are uh, milestones important? And then we also give you like external links that are not GitLab related, but more like from a um, industry level, what do people kind of assume uh, these things? Uh, what, what, what are the benefits of having adopted milestones also? Right. So this DevOps report is really our, just our first version of it. We are definitely going to move into a next version very soon, uh, incorporating like, like DevOps, uh, like, uh, like um, all the Dora metrics and so on and so forth. Okay. So yeah. Uh, next thing is uh, kind of giving an idea in terms of a um, insights. So just now when I, when I mentioned over here, this is uh, the project for GitLab dot org or our GitLab page um, uh, for our for our web platform. So over here you can actually see like across the months uh, how, how many um, pri high priority uh, um, tickets or issues that we are that are being created over time. Uh, of course as the company starts to grow and a lot of more people are adopting GitLab, we then start to have higher priority tickets or like the tickets in general starts to be starts to increase over time. So you can also see like the bugs created over time by severity and you can actually change it into different dashboards or so. Okay, um, how do you create this dashboard? So there is a YAML file that you can actually look at and you can actually create that. There is a sort of a documentation based on that. Um, if you're interested to know, just, uh, sorry, just uh, go in, just Google like uh, GitLab insights and you probably get to see like the, the steps. So it gives you like all the metrics that you can create your dashboards on. Even if you have certain, like you've created your own types of labels, you can actually create um, some of these uh, dashboards based on the labels that you have, uh, you have actually assigned to your project. Okay, so that's where issues, uh, insights are really useful. And that's how you see certain trends, trends. And the idea behind it is not only just to see the trends, but to actually take action from these trends and say, hey, you know, uh, over here in terms of uh, April, there is, a sim there is a slightly higher amount of issues during the month of April. So drill down into that, see what's wrong um, um, in, in, uh, during that month or so, and, and see whether you can make more decisions based on that. Uh, security dashboards. So this is a high level security dashboard. Um, so this is for our GitLab uh, platform as well. So please don't take screenshots and uh, you know, try to you know, mess around with our platform. <laughs> but a lot of these things that you get to see here, you, you get to see like, oh, we have certain um, critical uh, security uh, things that are happening. Um, there are some of the high, medium and low security threats that are happening here. So I think so far, um, uh, a few of these ones uh, you, you, can, you can actually take a look at um, and uh, your security team can then pick up on that and you know, uh, ensure that you are doing the right thing uh, or, or like focusing on the right kind of security threats that you have. So that's a very high level. If that's for vulnerability, you can have like for example, your license compliance, whether your, uh, the projects that you're working on, uh, what are the uh, project, are, are you license compliant or is there like investments that needs to be made um, to actually uh, become compliant by purchasing some of these licenses. So that's from a security perspective. Uh, and last but not least is the kind of the epics. So let me zoom down a little bit more because it's a bit hard to see. So personally for me, I'm actually involved in the product de development for GitLab as well in terms of like advanced searching. 
Um, so this is something that I actually look at quite often because I'm helping some of the developers to actually develop um, better search algorithms in terms of like where GitLab is at. Um, so one thing, first things first is that I would highly suggest using a label because you might have a lot of different uh, milestones that are available. And if you're looking at GitLab, like if I were to remove that label, it would actually lag my computer because GitLab has so many milestones that we have. Uh, but what I want you to see is that over here, you can see that there is this uh, milestone, which is like 13.4, 13.5, 13.6. And over in 13.6 over here, you can see that these are some of the enhancements that we are uh, basically going to be doing in our next version of our GitLab when we do release it. And over here, uh, I think Rob has mentioned as well, if for example, you have sub epics uh, within the main epic or so, you can actually see that and how they break down and see um, in terms of completion rate, um, based on your own, you know, thresholds that you have set for these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, milestones, right? So this is very important for you in terms of like planning for your organization and helps you to see uh, overall how your organization is performing and what your roadmap is and gives that transparency to your customers as well. Okay, so that is basically it. Um, Again, uh, it's, uh, it's, this uh, whole session is not supposed to be exhaustive in terms of giving you an idea, like going through every single feature in GitLab, but these kinds of like uh, gives you an uh, idea in terms of like the plan as well as like the analytics components of what GitLab can offer and how do we make use of these tools in a day-to-day -day on like organizations make use today. So with that, um, I think I'll hand it back to Alita who will kind of go through the questions. Yep, so um, <clears throat> we've got a couple of questions here. Um, let's go through it one by one, starting from Saurav Sharma. Um, how can we do monitoring of mobile apps in GitLab? Something like New Relic or Google Firebase do. Uh, so John, would you like to answer that? Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I, so just a bit of background, I did come from an APM company previously as well. So I used to do a lot of these kind of uh, mobile app monitoring. Uh, so I'll be upfront with you and say that GitLab, we are not there yet in terms of uh, mobile app monitoring. Uh, even for our web monitoring, we still use like uh, open source uh, kind of APM tools such as Jaeger, um, which, and, and we are quite, um, how do you say, technology agnostic in that sense where we don't really it, it really doesn't matter what kind of APM tools you would monitor. Um, we do have mobile app scan, mobile development scanning though. So that's something that we released recently in 13.5 in terms of like security scanning. So I think that's something you can take a look at. Um, but around the idea of monitoring, I would say still focus on the companies that are good at doing this, these things. Um, and then, um, you know, you can incorporate that as part of your like CI/CD process uh, when you're building up your 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 files also. Um, but yeah, we do we are we are not that mature in that mobile app uh, monitoring as of now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, moving on to the next question by Gita. Um, so for planning, how can we include company provided holidays and people leave plans? So Rob, would you like to answer this one? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so we don't have any, anything specifically around, uh, creating holiday plans or, or anything like that. Um, one, one of the best workarounds that I could think of though, was, um, if you, if you were to create some sort of a, an issue that said that, uh, on leave and then assign that to a person and then put that into the sprint, you could see that uh, when, when they were gonna be on leave and use the uh, due dates and that sort of thing to work out when they're gonna be back, just so you've got that visual reminder within your project management tool to uh, remember that the person is actually not on leave. Um, GitLab's really focused more around what people are doing and not whether they're like, uh, like the, the holidays and that sort of thing that they're doing. You'll, you'll notice that, that they, they don't have any activity within GitLab issues or, or anything like that while they're on leave though. So there's, there's not anything specific, but there are a couple of workarounds that you could uh, get through. Okay, cool. Thanks Rob. Uh, moving on to the next one by Dave, Dave Huang. Um, can the CICD analytics compare each commit and when there's a spike of process time, then it can send out some sort of notification, then maybe tech lead can involve and check that commit. 
uh, John, maybe you could answer this one. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think I get where you're coming from. I don't think we are there yet as well in terms of being able to take action. Uh, so uh, yeah, at, at this point, so a bit of background is that I used to work in more of like a security background, uh, security as well, where they have this, uh, like in security tools, they have this idea of SOAR, S-O-A-R, where you basically have an incident and it automatically does a certain thing such as like sending incidents out. Um, I don't think we are there yet uh, at, in, in terms of GitLab right, platform. Um, so right now it's mostly more from a, uh, yeah, I, I think it's still quite early on in terms of like, we, we are still at a page where we can actually see information from that point onwards. Uh, what you could potentially do is of course, um, you can potentially build your own custom solution where you can actually use GitLab API to pull out certain data and then using some form of a, uh, Solutions maybe like a like a elk kind of a stack to actually build um, certain incident rules on top of that, yeah. So uh, in short, not there yet. Um, Rob, do you have something? Oh. Yeah, just just to build on top of that, like um, in the CI/CD analytics graphs, there there is like a, a little bit of functionality there for that. So uh, one of the things that you can see is a graph of the duration of the pipelines that have been run on the last thirty commits. Right, so pipelines get run every commit. Uh, so you can see the duration uh, over that, the, the last 30. So you can see uh, the spikes uh, over that, as well as over some of the longer periods, like uh, over week, month, or yep. year. But there's no, as Jonathan says, right, there's no uh, notification or mechanism for uh, making something off that. It would have to be a manual thing or uh, a different tech stack that's been created and, and integrated with the GitLab API to, to get that. Yeah. But if, you, if you're looking at the graphs, there is something there for you to see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Rob and John. Um, so next one from Prashant Kulkarni. Uh, what level of GitLab usage knowledge is expected from a Scrum Master to be able to set up the GitLab for a project? Um, so Rob or John, who wants to take this one? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and, and it's going to change depending on your team, right? Uh, so basically, like what, what we've shown today is sort of where I would, I would think that most Scrum Masters would need to be, right? Having the ability to manage the uh, members of groups so that you can see your, your team members and then uh, setting up milestones and creating epics and issues and, and then looking at the boards. So beyond that, there's, uh, there's not a huge amount of not, like, uh, usage knowledge expected from a Scrum Master, despite the fact that GitLab has capabilities to go way beyond that, right? So we've just looked at the plan and manage stage. Beyond that, you have your source code repository with merge requests. You have CI CD pipelines. You have uh, integrations with Kubernetes, deployment uh, in, uh, environments dashboards. None of that is needed for a project manager. That's more around like the operations and the software developers. Um, so really it's just about uh, being able to plan your work. So uh, similarly, right, like you, you just need to be able to look at the epics and, and be able to define all the work and then let, let your team members know where, what that work uh, is so that then they can action those issues and take it all the way through the DevOps lifecycle because there are lots of different teams that are involved in the DevOps lifecycle. Cool. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, so the last one from Kolipara Gupta, is it possible to label the pipeline with past percentage? Uh, yeah, so I, I think I understand where you're coming from in terms of the like, uh, because right now we, it just shows like all and then success, right? It doesn't have to show a percentage or so. Uh, that's actually a very good question. So as in, that's a very good, um, um, I, I would say it's a it's something that we should definitely look on. Um, what I'll suggest, as I understand, this is kind of what you're looking at, and it just kind of gives you numbers in terms of in terms of rather than percentages. Uh, so yeah, I, I I think that's a really good idea, and I, I would suggest maybe you can actually raise an issue on 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 something like that, um, and then I think our developers will look into that. Yeah, but yeah, a good point. Yeah, I think that's something that would be very useful for a lot of teams as well. Okay, cool. So we have another one from Saraf again. Um, is there a way to hide source code from reporter user? 
I would like to not show the code to our testing team. Mm. Uh, so John or Rob? Uh, I, I, I'm not 100% I'm sure that, 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 that this is correct, but I, I don't believe that we can uh, change the, the, the viewing permissions there. So um, yeah, the, 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 the thing with the, the testing team though is that um, like, like they, 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 they don't need to necessarily, uh, what, what you could do then is create a, a board at a higher level, right? At a group level. And then that's where your testing team can work rather than in the actual project itself. So in, in, in that way, the, the, the testing team is a, is a separate entity within GitLab and has its own workflow and, and that sort of thing. Um, so they can create their own issues and, and have their own boards and, and work in their own way. And in that way, they'll be entirely separated from the process of actually creating the code. And then you can uh, create issues within the, the testing team board that, that is then like, please test uh, my app. We need this, 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 and this tested. And then the testing team can work that through their workflow. Okay. Yeah, I, thanks. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, John. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, 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 uh, because while Rob was talking, I was kind of like, you know, doing a bit of research on that. So yeah, I think within a single project, uh, in terms of like the reporter developers maintenance also, um, you can't restrict the viewing um, on that. So I think uh, what Rob, kind of idea makes a lot of good sense in that sense that you kind of separate them in terms of project and then you can then have that role-based access control on two separate projects. Um, I mean, within GitLab also, you can kind of do like a cross project functionality where you can actually run a certain pipeline in your development team, which then triggers another job in your pay me testing team also. So your testing team only just looks at their project, which is just purely on test. Okay, um, so yeah, we've got another one <laughs> from Venkat Um So in branch level access, can we restrict the teams? So, so unfortunately we can't, we can't do that at the moment. Um, the, the membership is uh, to an entire project rather than individual branches. So once you have membership of a project, then you have membership of all the branches. The, what, what you can do though is restrict who can push and merge uh, re merge requests for uh, specific branches by using protected branches. So by default in your repository, master is the protected branch. And so uh, only people who are uh, have a certain permission level, I think it's maintainer, are allowed to merge merge requests into that the master branch. And you can set that up for any number of branches. You can unprotect master if you wanted to. Uh, it's it, it's uh, for, for any branch but you can't specifically restrict members from being able to view a branch if they're a member of the project. Yep. Cool. Yep. Thanks. Uh, John, anything else you want to add? I uh, know. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, same thing uh, with what Rob said. Okay. Okay, cool. So since we're running out of time, um, thank you so much, uh, John and Rob for a very insightful presentation. And once again, thank you so much everyone for tuning in today. We hope you found it valuable. Um, a reminder that the presentation will be shared with you uh, via email after uh, you know a couple of days. Um, so before we go, I would like to announce that we will be hosting a live virtual hands-on workshop on December 8th. So we will uncover how the most effective application development teams leverage GitLab to automate their DevOps process and achieve material business outcomes. So keep an eye out for registration details in the follow-up email. Uh, so thank you once again, everyone. See you next time. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. Bye. Bye.